And today the word is titled, I am not of this world. So if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to John chapter 8, verses 21 through 30. John chapter 8, verses 21 through 30. And if you don't have your Bibles, as always, the words will be on the screen for your encouragement. This is the word of the Lord from John 8, verses 21 through 30. So he said to them again, I'm going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself, since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. And as He was saying these things, many believed in Him. Amen. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that we're able to freely call you that. Even in the midst of our brokenness, even in the midst of our lives that are scattered all across what we see as reality, what we have planned on, what we have placed our hopes in, we know that you are not only merciful, but that you are present with us, and that in the Holy Spirit, you continue to redeem and sanctify us as your people and church. As we're gathered here in your presence because of your anointing, would you help us not only to worship you, but to be humbly open and aware of your moving and of your word that transforms and convicts and feeds our souls. Um, In that, Father, that we would walk away from this place not only filled, but also able to, in a growing and faithful manner, um, be the reflection of your grace and to be the salt and light that you have called us to be. Holy Spirit, would you minister to us at this time? Would you encourage those who are struggling? Would you humble those who are trying to fly by the efforts and powers of our own abilities? And Heavenly Father, in your sovereign love and presence, would you be worshipped and glorified in all that we do? Thank you that you are good, and thank you that we can trust and have our faith in your goodness that is ever-reaching. And it's your name we pray. Amen. I hate... I mean, it's gonna, this, is, this is a statement, right? But I, I'm, I'm not a fan of Alaska. I just, I don't get it. I, I don't understand. There's mosquitoes that are the size of your palm, and I just don't really enjoy the idea of Alaska. Um, but the main reason of my distaste for Alaska, the state, I mean, not the people, not the mountains and the bears and the salmon, that's all good, um, is that in my junior year after high school, uh, I had the privilege of going to Korea, for a whole month with my best friend in the world. And some guy in Korea who knew our family made the mistake of giving me, a 16-year-old boy, $10,000 in cash. That's a lot of money. He gave me an envelope, and I thought it was a book. And I went home and I opened it, and it was just tens of thousands of dollars. I I, I felt like my life was set. I was going to just be a rich person forever. And so we spent that month, me and my best friend, traveling all over Korea and doing what 16, 17-year-old boys do, which is ultimately we sat in PC bongs all day and all night and played video games. We didn't have to go to Korea for that. Uh, But that's what we did. And after this month of just doing whatever it was, taking taxis for two blocks and eating food and whatever, it was time to go home. And so we got on this 747 Boeing jet. We hadn't slept for three days. Literally not a minute of sleep because we were trying to enjoy the last moments of our lives in Korea and this freedom with all this money. And so we got on this plane and we immediately both passed out before they even went over the safety checking. And we were flying across the ocean and I remember there was kind of a bump and I opened my eyes and it was kind of a weird thing but nobody else seemed to be freaking out and the flight attendants were pretty calm so I went back to sleep. 
And there was this feeling then of a loud noise, and then our plane, later I found out after we landed, dropped 1,500 feet in about four seconds. Uh, All I remember of that was that everyone started screaming, and then the roller coaster went down, and 467 souls were just in shock. And I looked out the left window that I was near, and one of the engines was on fire, literally on fire. And so the pilot came over the intercom and said, ladies and gentlemen, we have a small hiccup in our plans, and we are going to make an emergency landing in Alaska. And so this is why I don't like Alaska, because our plane barely made it to this airport, this tiny airport, and 460-something people got off at this airport that barely had enough room for 100 people to stand in, and we were in a long line, and one agent had to rebook and get 460-something people to all of their homes in America. Because we were high schoolers, because we were scared, because we were broke and sitting at the back of the plane, we were 420th in line. And this, this line moved at a snail's pace. And remember, we hadn't slept for two or three days, and I'm just not okay. And after the seventh hour of just sitting and taking a step every hour and a half, this woman came by saying, if you would like a hotel room, Northwest Airlines, which deservedly no longer exists, will give you a free hotel room in the luxury accommodations of this podunk little town. And I was excited. I wanted to stay. At this point, I would have just been an Alaskan. I would just live there, and I don't need to go home. I'm tired. I'm scared. I'm wet. It's cold, and I don't know what else to talk to about the elderly couple in front of me anymore. I knew their grandchildren's names. I knew what he did for work. I knew his retirement plan. Like, I'm, I was done. And so I started to bug my best friend, this guy that I grew up with. And I was like, hey, let's let's get the hotel room. Hey, let's get the hotel room. And for no reason, he kept on saying, no, we're staying in this line. No. And remember, we had nothing to do. So every 15 minutes, I would bother him. I would pester him. And this is at the point where you're with someone for so long that you're getting sick of each other. Three hours had passed, and we were not 10 feet further in line. And finally, I said, Peter, let's get the hotel room and sleep. And finally, said, go ask her for details. So I went on a line, and I went to the lady, and I said, what, what do we need to do? And she said, all I need is your name, your passport number, and I will send you to the thing. And then she said, and here's what bothered me, if you take the hotel room, you will not get home for three days. Three days. I didn't care. I was Alaskan just by nature at this point. So I went back to my friend and I said to Peter, okay, not a big deal. They just need our names. They need our passport numbers. And by the way, if we take the room, we won't be home for three more days. But that's not a big deal. We get to go sleep and we get to go enjoy Alaska for whatever it is in this small town. And this guy looked at me and had the audacity to say, no, we're staying in this line. And at this point, we're about 18 hours in. We spent ultimately over 24 hours in line. And I wanted to physically harm this guy. He was the one obstacle stopping me from going to this bed. And I remember as we were standing there, I was just fuming in my head. And I was just like, let's just get the hotel room and rest. Who cares if we don't get home today? And I finally said, I'm going to ask him one more time. If he says no, I'm never going to ask him anything again. I'm also not going to be his friend anymore. So I said, Peter, in all honesty, I'm dead. I'm so tired. We haven't slept in four days now. Can we just get the hotel room? And he turned to me and he said, this is the last time I'm going to say this. So those are fighting words for guys, if you don't know. This is the last time I'm going to say this. And he said, I'm not going to that hotel room because this is not our home. I want to go home. And so we waited in line for, I don't know, seven, eight, nine more hours And we were home. And we didn't talk for a solid two weeks after that. (laughs) We're okay now. He's still my best friend. But we won't travel anywhere one-on-one for a while. This, This stuck with me. This stuck with me not just because it's relevant to our sermon today, but this stuck with me, and I think about it from time to time, because of not only what he said, but the urgency and the genuine and just down to his root, core belief that he said it in. I want to go home. This place, this airport, this state 
no matter how picturesque, no matter how tired I am, this, even though we are here right now, is not our home. Our goal is somewhere else. Our place is somewhere else. Our family is somewhere else. My motivation, my identity, my every hope is to leave here and to go where I am trying to go, which is home. This isn't it. When we take this idea into the Christian context of the gospel, then I wonder if we feel the same way. And I understand that I'm speaking to a congregation that lives in a place where it's kind of a bubble and we are very comfortable for the most part here. And yes, our problems are real, but like the kids like to say these days, first world problems. But there's a clear distinction from Jesus and from the gospels and even the word of God where it says, this place is not our home. And yet I wonder if you and I ever think about whether we are building our lives, whether we are building our faith, whether we are yearning and straining and waiting faithfully for some place that is not here. Are we working for, are we raising our children and families in, and are we building in obedience and faith towards what God calls us to, which is not ultimately here? Where is our home? In our text today, Jesus is primarily speaking to a group of Jews, and namely, among that group of Jews, there's his opponents, the Pharisees. And remember who the Pharisees were, his opponents who only seek for Christ's destruction and their stubbornness and their disobedience because they want to get rid of the obstacle of Jesus to preserve their own power, to preserve their own position and life in this world. Jesus is a threat to that. And there are three exchanges in our text that Jesus has with them. And the first one is verses 21 and 22. Jesus says, I'm going away. He says, I'm leaving this place, I'm going away, and when I do, you may look for me, you will seek me, but you will not find me. In fact, you will not only not find me, but you will die in your sins for where I am going. You cannot come. The Pharisees wonder what Jesus means by that. Is the dude going to kill himself? Where is he going? Is it in Aruba? We don't have jets right now. Where is Jesus going, and why can't we go there? On top of that, this guy from the middle of nowhere, where can he go in this world that we, Pharisees, powerful, influential, most of us rich, that we cannot reach on our own? In this series of exchanges, Jesus, Jesus is clearly set in the boundaries of who he is versus who unbelievers and the Pharisees, the opponents of Christ, are. Jesus is saying, I and everything that I am about is on one side, and you and everything you are about in unbelief are opposite from me. There is a chasm in between, and you and I are not of the same ilk, we are not of the same fabric, we are not of the same motivation. There are consequences that are coming to those who do not believe in what I am giving in the good news, that I am the Son of God and I am the promised Messiah. And all this is summed up in John 3, verses 18 and 19. Whoever believes in me, or whoever believes in him, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe, he is condemned already. This is in the PowerPoint, Alan. I don't know if you have it. No? Okay. Okay. So let me start over then. John 3, 18, 19. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works are evil. It's pretty clear in what the gospel says. If you believe in faith, you are of Christ, and you will be with him where he is. You will be given salvation and redemption. If you do not believe, if you reject, which is totally up to you, then you will be in the darkness, and in your sin you will find judgment and destruction. In fact, all of Scripture, both Old and New Testament, is chock full with this warning of faithfulness versus unbelief. Those who believe will be saved by their faith in Jesus as Messiah. Luke 23, John 14, Mark 16, Romans 10, John 3, 16, etc., etc. And those who do not believe will find not only death and judgment, but rejection from God. Romans 2, John 3, Luke 12, John 12, Hebrews 3, Romans 6, etc. 
So as we just think about this first exchange, even here, this is a whole sermon in itself. As we think about this first exchange, there's this fear bubbling in my heart. And the fear is this. Then does faith in Christ require leaving what I'm comfortable with? If Jesus, who did ministry here for three years of his earthly life, if Jesus, who shared the gospel and was the embodiment of the grace of God, is now towards the end of his ministry and time on earth, if he says, I am leaving, then if I am a so-called believing disciple of Jesus Christ, then does it mean that my heart is going with Jesus, that my ultimate end goal is not here, but it is wherever Jesus is? Or am I going to stay here and be apart from him eternally? By his physical separation from earth and his disciples, Jesus is laying the foundation for the difference between faithfulness in Christ and unbelief and rejection. There is no middle ground. There is no gray. There is no lukewarm. There is no maybe if, if I'm in the mood. It's one or the other. A clear line and distinction. The second exchange continues in verses 23 and 24, where Jesus clearly lays out that I am not of this world. Jesus continues saying, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, but unless you believe that I am he, the Messiah, the chosen one, the promised Savior, you will die here and everything for you will end here in this life. Christ's point is not only to highlight the consequences of belief or unbelief, but the place of their righteousness and love. Remember, the the fulcrum, the center of the gospel, is that we believe in Christ as Lord and Savior, and he is our salvation. He is our righteousness. He is the one that brings us to redemption and the grace of God. Whereas anything and everything else, the responsibility lies within us. I am responsible. I am able to save myself. I am able to be good enough, according to the rules, to accomplish or achieve Salvation, an impossible goal. So when Jesus says, I am not of this world, his primary focus and purpose is not grounded here in this life. His ultimate and end goal is not what we do, not what we experience, not what we accomplish, not what we accumulate here. Now notice what Jesus doesn't say. Jesus is not saying, none of this matters, just flow through life and the goal is to go to heaven. No, scripture is pretty clear on that. The gospel says we are reflections of God's glory anywhere and everywhere we go. We should pursue faithful excellence in all that we do for the glory of God. But what he is saying is, but our heart motive, our ultimate goal, our ultimate place of faith is not here, but it is in God and wherever he is and whatever he is doing. If sin is equated with a primary love for this world and this life, then to have our comfort, our motivations and desires based in the here and now only is a direct sign of rejection of the grace of God. The point of Jesus is to reveal the need for our salvation. That we would want to be where he is. That we would want to be like him wherever we are. That faith requires that we not only seek him, but emulate him and desire him as our greatest and first love. The opposite of that, the consequence of that, is that we will die. That we will cease. That we will be lost in judgment and rejection. Again, it's above and below, not of this world and of this world. It's God and sin. It's heaven and earth. They're two different signs. And the third exchange happens in verses 25 through 29. Jesus says, I am about the Father, and the Father is about me. I am about the Father in all that I do, and I know and trust in faith that the Father then is about me and walking with me to the end that he has in store for me. The Pharisees asked Jesus at this point, then who are you? Who do you think you are? Who are you to say this? Who are you to reject us? Who are you to draw a line in the sand and say, choose one side or the other? And Jesus answers them, I am who I have been telling you I am from the very beginning. I am the one. 
I am the Son of God. I am the hope of the world. I am the Prince of Peace. I am the Redeemer and the Promised Savior and Messiah. And he says, I have much to say about you. I have much to judge you on. I know you. I understand you. I hear your thoughts. I know what's in your heart. And yet, even in this moment, even in this what seems like confrontation and harshness, harshness and division, even now I am not destroying you, though I could, because that's not the will of the Father. The Father still wants me to give you the good news. And I do what the Father has told me to do. I speak what the Father has taught me to say. And I will love you as the Father, even now, offers you grace. But there's a point in verse 27 where it says that the Pharisees still did not understand that Jesus was talking about the Heavenly Father, that this was the gospel, and that they were missing the point because they were so focused on their power, their presence, their authority, and this life in this world. So Jesus continues to offer them the truth in verse 28. He says to them, when you have lifted me up, and this was a powerful phrase actually in the Greek, when you have lifted me up, at first I thought, when did the Pharisees and the opponents of of Jesus ever lift him up in celebration and glory and honor? No, what he means is, when you have lifted my body up to crucify me, when when I know what's coming, when it happens, when I've predicted When you are screaming at the top of your lungs, crucify him. Give us Barabbas, the thief and murderer. When you have lifted me up, then you will see and then you will know that I am who I said I am. That I am the Son of God. I do nothing on my own authority. I am not about my own purpose. Otherwise, I would not do what the Father has called me to do. Remember what Jesus does on the night before his crucifixion? He goes to the garden, and what does he do? He prays. What does he pray? Father, if this can pass from me, in other words, if I don't have to do this because I don't want to, because it's not my choice, it's not what I feel like doing, then please let it pass. I do not want to go through this simply for these unbelieving and betraying people. But at the very end of pouring out his heart, what does he say? But let your will be done. The son submits to the father. Because the purpose of even Jesus is that he is about the Father, and the Father is about the Son, and that even if it costs him anything and everything, he will obey. Jesus says, I do nothing of my own authority. I do nothing of my own purpose. I do nothing of my own timeliness or feelings or motivation. I simply obey the Father, because that's what I'm here to do. He is always with me. I am not alone and I am not of this world. What's powerful here is that Jesus not only reveals his identity and purpose in the Father's will, but he also reveals the mentality and the rhythm of a Christian. That though, whether you are powerful or weak, whether you are rich or poor, whether you've been a Christian for a long time or a short time, whether you think you're a Christian or not, whether you're still wrestling with doubt and assurance in your life, the the blueprint and the footprints in the sand that we have to walk in is the example that Jesus gives here. I am about the Father, and the Father is about me. And whether it works out, whether it's pleasing to me, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether I succeed, whether I fail, I will submit in faith and obey the Father's will for my life. But in this, Jesus is not alone. Faith assures us of not only our identity and purpose, but as Jesus reminds us, true faith in Christ gives us a growing assurance and confidence of the truth that God is with us, that God is for us, and that God is moving us toward his purpose and glory. He will not forsake us. For as we live in faith day after day, it's not just that we get more powerful, but the presence and purpose and peace of God gets more powerful and foundation within who we are. Again, heaven and earth, temporary and eternal, salvation and death and judgment, this world and not of this world. There's a decision. 
The thing that irked me about this text, or the thing that stood out to me, was not even the first 11, 10 verses, but it was the last one. Because even today, in, in our church, in the church in America, there's this notion and there's this idea that unless the gospel is presented in a cushy, pillowy, self or human, uh, human encouraging always way, that we will never be able to win people. And remember the, the tone of how this conversation is happening between Jesus and the Pharisees, Jesus and the Jews who reject and, and deny him. It seems to be, even from Jesus' side, it seems to be confrontational, harsh, and difficult. But we forget that the message that Jesus is offering, the loving discipline that he gives to the people, is one grounded in mercy and love, not hatred and rejection. Even now, knowing full well that they will reject him, Jesus is offering them the truth of the good news. In verse 30, John closes it simply by saying, many heard of this and many believed. Many heard this message that seemed to strike at their very heart, that convicted them, that even challenged their passion, their motivation, what they are building their earthly kingdoms and lives upon, and yet the Holy Spirit convicted them, humbled them, and drew them not away from God, but into the mercy and the grace of God. Many people heard the good news from Jesus, and many people believed it's not hatred, it's loving discipline. And in this sense, even with the gospel, the church today has twisted it to, to this requirement that it needs to be palatable for me. It needs to be good in the way that I want it. It needs to be easy in the way that I can normally and just without any cost to myself accept it and be included in the kingdom of heaven while also living the fullness out of my life here on earth. And Jesus here is saying, is saying no, that's not what the gospel is about but if you surrender, I will have you. There's a couple of things I want us to think about today. And especially for me, this has been incredibly difficult. And what was ironic for me, especially as a human being, was that this didn't really bother me until this past year in my life. You know, when I was single, I could do whatever I wanted. You know, I lived for the glory of God. I served the church and the kingdom of God. And yeah, no matter what it cost me, no matter what it went through, no matter what country I, w I went to or what sickness I got or how difficult people were or whatever it was, yeah, it's fine. And then I got married and I thought everything would change. And turns out, sorry, nothing changed that much. Charlene was in it to the end. She understood the gospel, and so it was cool. Whether we suffered together or not, as long as we were together and we were seeking the glory of God, it was fine. Retirement plan, pa. God will provide. Turns out that that's not really true. We have responsibilities. We'll, we'll survive on love. Unfortunately, a patty melt sandwich feeds our stomach a lot more than being married. But when we have a child, this was the thing that changed everything for us. And it's different for everybody. Just because you're single or unmarried, and, or if you're married and you don't have kids, it doesn't mean that you know, you're, you're going to get there. But this is different for everybody. When I had a kid, and I looked at her chubby little face sleeping at night, what I think about now is, am I building this child up for God's glory and honor and purpose first? Am I preparing us as a family to honor and trust in God for eternity? Or am I willing and wanting to set us up for comfort now? 529. Savings plan. Make your kid rich, every Instagram video tells me, by investing $50 a month when they're zero, and by the time they retire at age 65, she will have $3.7 million. Listen, I, I know I'm not rich, but I have $50 a month. But if that comes at the cost of tithing, supporting, being generous with others, what am I doing here? The first point that I want us to consider is this, and it's a very simple truth that Jesus says, isn't it? This world is not our home. Whether you agree with it or not, that's up to you. But the simple statement that Jesus makes to his disciples, to the Pharisees, and to the crowds that are gathered around him is that he says, if you're about me, and if you're about the gospel, 
then what must transform faithfully, not perfectly, is that our mentality and our planning and our passion and our true love must shift from everyone else in this world to understand that this world and the urgencies of this world, the powers of this world, the truths of this world, the motivations of this world, though maybe good, are not the greatest thing. This world is not our home. Home is where the heart must be. And for every professing Christian and the good news of Jesus Christ, our home is in Christ, where he is and what he is doing and what he is all about. I wonder if we line up to that. If what we love is a way, then that is where our heart is. If Jesus is about heaven and the glory of God and the kingdom of God, I wonder how much of our lives are truly aligned with living for that, even in our small, imperceptibly weak ways today? How are we raising our children? How are we forming even the church, the so-called body of Christ? How are we serving one another out of love? How are we setting the priorities of our lives? How are we spending our resources, our time, our money, our abilities, our gifts? Even in studying, how, how, and perhaps more importantly, why are we studying? Is it to honor and glorify God? to please him in whatever we are doing, or is it to build our own temporary kingdoms here and now? Perhaps some questions that will help shape our motivations are, where do your passions and loves lie? Are most, if not all of them, here? Is it primarily rooted in this place, in this time, in this life, in this temporary reality that will end? Or is it, growing in the manner of having our passions be grounded in living this life faithfully, to trust in Christ that no matter what will come, he is with us, he is for us, and he will lead us to his end purposes. I find this important and valuable, not only just for us as individuals, but as the church. There has been no other time in American history where the church has allocated the majority or the amount of their budget to simply buildings and programs in that one place, versus how much we are spending as a large church, not just EPC, on mission, outreach, discipleship. There isn't. And just, just let's just look in the mirror for a second. As far as EPC goes, and this is not saying that we're doing this well or we're not doing this well, this is a question that we need to consider, not only as leaders but also as congregation members. Are we more infatuated with building a comfortable place that we can gather and having programs and having staff and only having the responsibility of being Christian to primarily staff, was just a smattering or a side add-on of mission and outreach of actually engaging our city, our country, and the world? Or should it be the other way around? Something to think about. I don't have the answers yet, but it's something that's important to think about because we must consider in all things that if this world is not our home, as Jesus declares then are, we, are our lives and are what we are a part of slowly becoming more and more aligned to the values of heaven? The second point is this. This world is, all, is not our home, but this world is a mere glimpse of what God has for us. This world is still, by God's grace, a glimpse of what God has for us in eternity and heaven and in reconciliation with him. Church, there can be good things in this world. There can be. There are good things in this world by the grace of God. For me, this is where it comes from. What I love more than almost anything when we eat, even if it's expensive, is I love, is I love going to a place that sells pizza by the slice. Because rarely, if ever, will I ever finish a whole pizza. Ten years ago, maybe, I could finish a Costco pizza. Now, after two slices, I want to I throw up. But what I love is I love going to a pizza by the slice place, hopefully a good place. And what I love to do is I like to order a piping hot piece of cheese pizza that they reheat in the oven. And then on the side of that, all I want, the only thing I want of that, more than my wife and child, is an ice cold, bubbling fountain drink called Coca-Cola. It's the best combination ever invented on earth. The last time I went there, It was to Brooklyn Pizza. I think it was on El Camino Real. I got the piece of pizza, and I ordered a Coke, and I'm sitting there expectantly waiting. 
And finally, after my pizza comes, the lady comes up to me and says, I'm so sorry, there's a problem. I said, what's the problem? And she said to me, our Coke is out. But I have a solution. And I said, hit me. And she said, we have Diet Coke. Now, I know there's people in here that's obsessed with Diet Coke. If you love Diet Coke, that's okay. And there's no judgment. I have been known to drink Diet Coke myself. But she gave me the Diet Coke, and it was good, but it wasn't the Coke. And what was interesting to me as I drove away from that place was I was not satisfied. It was close, but it wasn't enough. In Korean, in Korean we say it's missing that 2%. It's decent, but it's not there. That's our life here. Even in our relationships, think about it. Think about the best relationship that you have, whether it's a significant other, whether it's a child, whether it's your best friend, whoever. Think about the amazing times that you've had together. The trust, no matter what you're going through, you can go to that person and they will accept you and hear you out and support you, even if you're wrong. And yet, even in those great relationships, there is uneasiness, there's betrayal, there's hurt, there's stubbornness, there's pride. That is just a glimpse of not just what friendship in heaven is, but what the grace and relationship of our, of that we have as children with our Heavenly Father. Food, experiences, music, art, beauty. I think there's almost nothing more beautiful than like a really well-kept garden that someone takes pride in. They go and give it food from Scott's Turf Builder every spring and fall or whenever you're supposed to do it. But even in those places, there are weeds You have to constantly be on your hands and knees and do work. That's just a glimpse of the harmony of earth, of nature, of God's creative diversity that we have and that he will bring us back to. The world is a mere glimpse of what God has for us. It's a shadow of God's goodness and grace. We can appreciate and even enjoy the good things of life in this world, but I'm afraid that our problem is that we don't appreciate those things and they don't propel us to turn to God to look for what he has for us. We appreciate the things of this world, and that's all we want. That's all we base our lives on. That's all we hope in. That's all we work for. That is our identity, more than the good news of Jesus. The tragedy is that we find our ultimate satisfaction of hope in temporary things of this world that will never satisfy us. We idolize power and money and comfort. All these are good things, but again, they are not the greatest things in the eyes of a kingdom believer. Third and final point is this. In faith, we are called to live and obey and be the will of the Father. You know, it doesn't sound like a very transformational statement that Jesus makes towards the end when he says, I am about the Father and the Father is about me. And that even if I don't feel like it, even if it's something that I don't choose or want to do, that I will submit and obey in faith the will of the Father to please him, to glorify him, to honor him, to make him known. This is not just something that Jesus does, but in faith in Jesus as Christ, as, as Christ and Lord and Savior, as Christians, those who are alike and becoming more like Christ, then that is our motivation here in this world. Whether you're a student, whether you're a young adult, whether you're an adult, no matter what your social definition is, that we are called to live, obey, and actually strive to grow in our ability to be the will of the Father. How are we seeking to usher in the kingdom of God faithfully in our lives today? Faithfully, not perfectly. How are we growing in witnessing the gospel? How are we growing in submitting to the will of God when the Holy Spirit convicts us, rather than choosing our own isolation, choosing our own comfort, and choosing what we feel like in that moment? How are we growing in the fruit of the Spirit? How are we practicing and not just receiving, but daring to pour out, to participate, to serve, to give people compassion and and mercy and forgiveness? True faith understands that the Father is the goal that who he is, where he is, and what he is about is our heart motive. And that's not super Christian, that's not super mature, or that's not elder, deacon, pastor. That's just what a child of God is and does. True faith understands that the Father is the goal. 
that whether you study, whether you work, whether you have a family and your friends and your community and your church, whatever and wherever you go, that you are the salt and light of the earth and that you live in this world knowing that this is temporary and that God is calling us to another place to be with him. But grace is about, the gospel is about grace, not condemnation. If anything, let's not get this twisted today. Christ is not being harsh. Christ is not being transitionary between like, I just need to know who's on my side and not. He's inviting and beckoning to you, no matter where you are in your faith, whether you have been struggling with Christ for decades or not. He is beckoning us in grace to believe in faith and to surrender to what he is calling us to be. Perhaps this whole entire sermon could have been one quote from C.S. Lewis. Here's what it is. It's from Mere Christianity. Most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you but they never quite keep their promise. So if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was, listen, made for another world. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. And so as Christians, what must we do? I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find until after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country and to help others do the same. Beloved, this is the call of the gospel. Not because C.S. Lewis is a powerful man or an important man on his own, but he is merely reflecting to us what the gospel says. This world is not our home, but praise be to God that Christ is the bridge that gives us salvation and gives us an identity and a purpose and a plan to live for his glory even now in our brokenness. Let us rejoice and be glad and let us respond with joy in the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Before we close in the song of response, uh, would you wonder and ask the Holy Spirit um, whether we have been building our lives for satisfaction and completion in the here and now, in what is temporary and earthly, or whether we have been willing in faith to submit and surrender even our motivation, even our goals, and even the very valuablest things in our lives for God's glory, trusting that he is not only enough, but he is bringing us from death to life, from condemnation to redemption, and from earth into what he has in store for us in heaven, in the new heaven and the new earth. For some of us, knowing that we have been doing this, these things, would you trust that God is merciful and faithful and humility? Would you confess and repent? And would you ask him to strengthen you to respond from this moment on, and it's never too late, from this moment on, in a manner that is obedient, that lives for the kingdom and the home that we have in Christ Jesus. Let's take a minute in prayer and reflection, and I'll close us after a few moments. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, as you declared so clearly and so powerfully that you are not of this world, would you help us to be able to not only hear you, but to understand you, and in faith, to accept that as a redeeming quality and truth for our lives. Lord, would you give us strength and courage to persevere well? Would you help us to reprioritize who we are, what we are about, what we're pursuing, what we love, what we value, what we invest in, and how we even spend ourselves in a manner that is growing in faithfulness to match who you are and what you have done and what you call us to as your children, redeemed by the grace and power of the cross. Father, help us not to have idols that weigh us down, that entrap us in this world. Give us the faith, the sight and faith to see what things in our lives are truly good that lead us to you and what things that distract us from you, that chain us to this life as we believe the lies and the agendas of this world. And Lord, that as we grow in this, as we are more assured in this, as we are, Father God, more able to surrender and obey to you in this, that it would not only please you, but that through our lives that we would be a living sacrifice that encourages others, that shows your grace and transformative power to others, that encourages them to continue to walk and mature in your image. Thank you that we have a home to return in, in you that we did not have before. Forgive us, Father, for being so enamored with what is immediately in front of us and so easily forgetting who you are and what you are calling us to in the cross. And thank you that in your word you remind us not as an act of harshness or hatred, but that even now it is an act of mercy, of loving discipline to bring us back to you, your very creation, purpose, and order. We commit ourselves to you at this time, Heavenly Father, as you will let it be done. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.